Nathan Cha. Sean Cove. Leo Connolly. Patrick Zarnick. Daniel Dalton. Dante De Prospero. Ryan Dolotowski. Emma Ewing, Luca Francis Keeney, Ryan Gallagher, Carlos Gutierrez.
if you don't mind being quiet, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today. So today we're really lucky to have Dr. Marco Clark from the Holy Cross Institute join us. I'm going to read a little bio about Dr. Clark. A veteran of Catholic education, Dr. Clark is currently president and CEO of Bishop McNamara High School, a school founded and sponsored by the Brothers of Holy Cross. The role of executive director aligns with Dr. Clark's experience and professional goals. The Holy Cross Institute is responsible for strengthening and assuring the Holy Cross character and identity of the secondary schools, colleges, and universities sponsored by the Congregation of Holy Cross. The Institute provides resources, programs, and events that educate administrators, faculty, board members, and students on the unique educational legacy of the Congregation of Holy Cross. Dr. Clark earned his bachelor's degree in psychology from the College of Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, and his master's in education in guidance and counseling from Bowie State University in Maryland. He received his doctorate in interdisciplinary leadership from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Marco Clark. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tomasetti, Ms. Grillo. Thank you for the invitation today, Mr. Boyle, and of course, Mr. Tully. It's great to be with all of you. I was just saying that um, breakfast with guys doesn't need anything more than pancakes and bacon, and I see that you all are enjoying the pancakes and bacon. So, um, well, I had some very formal remarks that I was going to share with you today, but I'm going to get off script and talk with you a little bit. Um, first off, let me just say how much a pleasure it is to be here. I was here a couple of months ago, had a chance to meet with faculty and staff members. I toured around the school and uh, got a chance to peek into some of your classrooms. And you know what, it, it felt like a Holy Cross school, right? And, and my job today, and thank you for that kind introduction, but I'll tell you a little bit more about my background. My job today with the Holy Cross Institute, uh, which is located at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, is that I work with the 120 Holy Cross schools, colleges, and universities that are all over the world, right? So when you think about your Holy Cross experience here, I want you to think about this. Today, this very day, there are 110,000 students around the world who are receiving a Holy Cross education, right? In countries like India and Bangladesh that have less than 1% Roman Catholics, right? In countries, parts of the world like uh, Uganda and Ghana, in some of the poorest regions of the world like Haiti, in some of the wealthier places of the world like Paris, France, and in Rome, Brazil, right? 120 Holy Cross schools around the world that you're a part of. And our tradition goes back 200 years, right? And, and you might learn this. Do they take a class on Holy Cross or do they, they, in their freshman year, get a, a, yeah, a little bit? So, yeah, so, you know, I, I'll, I'll kind of sprinkle in some of that history as we go through here. But it's remarkable to me that Holy Cross, which was founded. 200 years ago, right after the French Revolution, right? So I'm gonna ask for a little audience participation here. Um, what happened during the French Revolution? Who knows what happened in the French Revolution? Late, late uh, 1799 or so, yep. I believe the people tossed out the nobility. Okay, perfect, yeah. People tossed out the nobility, so they, they revolted against the nobility, yep, what else? So there were lots of beheadings, right? Lots of beheadings. Anybody ever been to Paris? Yep, you've been to Paris. Did you go to the Louvre? Did you go to the Louvre, which is the big museum, the, okay, the, the pyramid-shaped museum, okay? All right, at the Louvre, there were thousands, tens of thousands of beheadings that occurred right there in that square, right? Because people were revolting against the nobility, but there was more to it than that. What else happened in, uh, in the French Revolution? Anybody remember? Christianity was outlawed. Christianity was outlawed. Thank you. Right? Thank you. So what happened was, is there were multiple generations, multiple generations of people who were living with death, with despair, with political division, and they were not allowed to practice their faith. And if you were poor, you were not even allowed to be educated. 
right? That was the life of people in France in the late 1700s, early 1800s, okay? And after the French Revolution, after the French Revolution, what happened next was that people started saying, well, listen, if we need to prepare for a better world than the one we live in right now, we need to start with kids, right? And we're going to go into their schools and we're going to teach them to be better leaders. We're going to teach them to be Christian leaders. And this is going to segue into my talk a little bit. We're going to teach them to be Christian leaders so that then they can go out and they can change the world. Right, so the first schools were founded in 1820, and then in 1837, the Congregation of Holy Cross as we know it today was born, okay? So 1820 was when the first schools were, were uh, when the first group of teachers were teaching, and then in 1837 was when the Congregation of Holy Cross was born. Anybody been on the campus of the University of Notre Dame? Okay, lots of you. Right, I was just there two weeks ago. I'm there six or eight times a year. Right, I'm a big Fighting Irish fan. So, when you get there, anybody remember what the founding date of the University of Notre Dame is? 1842, exactly. Well done. Okay, so think about that. So this religious order that was founded in 1837, five years later, they were already going all over the world with the same type of educational message to build Christian leaders to change the world for the future, to prepare for better times, right? So University of Notre Dame was founded in 1842. Holy Cross College was founded actually that same, the previous year, 1841, was when the brothers arrived, okay? Um, and, then, uh, and then the founding of Holy Cross College came in the 1900s, so much later, St. Mary's College, so in this country, there's 28 Holy Cross schools, and there's eight colleges and universities. So 36 of them, right? University of Portland, St. Edward's University, where I am, the University of Holy Cross in uh, New Orleans. Out east, there's Stonehill College and King's College, which are in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, respectively. And then, of course, in South Bend, the University of Notre Dame, Holy Cross College, and St. Mary's. So that's what we're a part of. Right? With the same messaging of developing Christian leaders to prepare the world for better times. Now, what I started off by saying was that in France, at the time, there was death, there was division, political division, okay? There was terrible discouragement and despair. There was disease as well, okay? There was a plague that was going through France at that time. There was disease. You can imagine just the desperation that people felt during that period of time. Listen, I could have insert the year 2022 in front of that same thing. There's been death, there's been disease, we have political division, terrible political division. We know that the mental health of youth is uh, dealing with levels of depression and anxiety at higher levels than this country has ever known. And guess what? We as Dons, you as Dons, we as Holy Cross men, are called upon to be Christian leaders, to be voices of hope, to be disciples with hope to bring, to prepare for a better time. That's what we're called to. Now you might think to yourself, well gosh, leader, I'm not much of a leader. Well, first off, you have a title next to your name, but guess what? A title doesn't make you a leader. You're a Hesburgh scholar. You're a Don. You have those things going for you. What makes you a leader is the influence that you have, even if it's on just one person. Even if it's on just one person. Leadership is about influence. Leadership is about character. Let me change that, actually. Leadership is character. Leadership is character. So let me tell you a little bit about my own leadership journey, okay? I attended a Holy Cross Brothers school just like you did. It was an all-boys school, probably about the same size as, as Notre Dame, located right outside of Washington, D.C., right? I had grown up in a family of construction workers, and the expectation was that they were going to send me to Catholic school, which was going to give me good discipline because I wasn't, wasn't nearly as disciplined as I needed to be. 
They were hopefully going to help me grow in my spirituality, and then I was going to come back and work in a company in the family business in construction. All right? my, my grandfather was a bricklayer, my dad was a carpenter, my mom worked in the business. That was the expectation. But I got to Bishop McNamara High School, and I met the Holy Cross brothers who helped me to dream a little bit bigger. Okay, they helped me to dream a little bit bigger. And, and what resulted in that, I, I had been pretty heavily recruited for, for ninth grade because I was a football player, I was a quarterback at, at one of the local youth league programs. And I had this dream of playing pro football someday. And I wanted to be just like Joe Montana. I wanted to go to the University of Notre Dame, be a star quarterback at Notre Dame, go into the NFL and have a long career. So I arrive at Bishop McNamara High School, and that process begins, right? I played freshman football. The next year I made the varsity, and I became a three-year varsity starter at quarterback. And then came that period of time where you begin looking at colleges, right? I got recruitment letters from the University of Notre Dame and lots of other places. And one of the ones that really emerged for me was a place called Holy Cross, the College of Holy Cross, which is located in Massachusetts. And that's where I ended up going. I played four years of college football. I'll tell you a little bit about that story in a moment. Played four years of college football there. And then after all of that, I went into being a Catholic educator. And again, I wanna share that leadership journey with you, how all that happened. But let's go back to Bishop McNamara. Because when I arrived at Bishop McNamara, none of my parents, none of my relatives, my grandparents, no one had ever gone to college. But I had this goal to go to college, right? But I, as, I, as I came to the school, frankly, I was filled with just terrible insecurity and anxiety. Crippling insecurity and anxiety. And you might say, well, gosh, Dr. Clark, you were a quarterback. Yeah, I was a quarterback, I was a peer minister, I was. Um, class president, right? I mean, I, I was ranked in the top five of my class. But what people didn't know was going on on the inside of me was this awful insecurity, which led to anxiety. Now look, some of you are relating to that. I could look good on the outside. I could sound good on the outside. I could please the people around me. But on the inside, I was in pain, in real pain. And what happened over the course of those next three years was that I started making some decisions in high school that were just not good decisions. And it led me to getting into some trouble, which ultimately led to, uh, frankly, underachieving the way that I could have achieved in school and on the football field. Right? If I could go back and do those years all over again, there'd be certain things that I would do differently. I'm so thankful that one of the worst decisions that I made, actually, was that I, I led a revolt against the school based on a policy decision that was made. And I said, you know what? We don't like this decision, and I'm going to rally the troops. I'm going to rally my guys, my classmates, and we're going to just walk out of the school one day. Now, I don't recommend that to any of you. And the principal called me in. This is my senior year, and he really could have let me have it. But what that principal, Brother Walter Kramer, recognized in me was that I was really just a, a child in pain on the inside and trying to do things to please and impress other people, especially my classmates. And he said these words to me, and they have stuck with me, and I have repeated them thousands of times over the 33 years that I've worked in Catholic education. And it was a quote from scripture. And he said, Marco, you're a leader, and leaders can lead either in a good way or a bad way. And I want you to remember this quote from scripture. To whom much is given, much is required. I'll repeat that. To whom much is given, much is required. You see, men, you've been given gifts from God. You've proven that by being a Hesburgh Scholar. Some of you are great musicians, some of you are great athletes, some of you are great actors, right? Some of you are trying to figure out where our greatness might lie. 
But understand that you have gifts from God. To whom much is given, much is required. This gift of attending Notre Dame College Prep. To whom much is given, much is required. We have a responsibility as leaders to make the world around us better. That means to make our friends better. That means to make our neighborhoods better. That means to make our schools better. We have that responsibility. And we can do that just by giving an encouraging word sometimes, just by being kind and empathetic to people, right? Trying to lead a personal witness, a personal witness that inspires other people. You don't have to be charismatic. You don't have to be boisterous, vociferous, right? You don't have to be any of those things. But I can tell you that if you're kind, if you show empathy, if you show love, if you show encouragement and support, you're leading. You're leading. So the great lesson I learned from Brother Walter Kramer was that to whom much is given, much is required. And that lesson has stuck with me all the way through. So I go off to college at College of the Holy Cross, play football there. First season, we finish a disappointing four, six, and one. Our head coach, the previous year, had been mentioned in all the newspapers and the, and the NCAA magazines as a prime candidate to be the next head coach at the University of Notre Dame. Had we had the kind of success that year that he had had in previous years, he probably would have been the next head coach at the University of Notre Dame, Rick Carter. Okay? February 3rd of 1986, after, I'm, I'm a freshman in college, 500 miles away from home, we get a phone call in our dorm rooms we didn't have cell phones back in those days. The coaching staff called us into a meeting on February 3rd, 1986. And they announced to us that day that Rick Carter, our coach, had committed suicide. What people didn't know was that Rick Carter dealt with terrible anxiety and clinical depression. It was something that we didn't pay as much attention to in those days, right? And that tragic, tragic story for all of us young men, just like you, I sat in a room with a hundred of my teammates who had come from all over the country to play football at Holy Cross. And the guy that we trusted the most and loved the most that recruited us to be there departed from this earth. So you can imagine the despair, the discouragement, the depression, that all of us faced at that mark in time. And it was an assistant coach by the name of Mark Duffner, who now is an assistant coach with the Cincinnati Bengals. Mark Duffner was named the head coach, and Mark Duffner was one of the transformational, most transformational people in our lives. He knew that before we could ever be successful on the football field again, we had to heal on the inside. He loved us. He encouraged us. He challenged us to be better. The next three years, we go 10-1, 11-0, 9-2. He ended up having two more seasons at 11-0, and then became a college head coach um, uh, at the University of Maryland, and then he went into the NFL, where he spent now the last 25 years, 30 years, coaching the NFL very successfully. But more than any of the success on the football field was that Mark Duffner knew that we had to be leaders on the inside first. We had to heal on the inside first, and it was his love and encouragement that led to that. Now in college, I never became a starter. I was, if, the, if there was a 100-man roster my freshman year, I was probably somewhere between the 95th and 100th man on that roster. I was one of nine quarterbacks recruited. I got moved to defense my first day of practice, where I stayed for the next four years. And I always love to tell people that part of my football uh, claim to fame is that the guy that I backed up on defense, a guy named Gordy Lockbaum, Cordy Lockbaum played offense and defense and special teams. He was the only person in college football doing it at that time. As a result of that, 140, 150 plays a game, he became a Heisman Trophy candidate. 
and he, he was second in the Heisman Trophy race two years in a row, okay, in 1986 and 1987. I backed Cordy up on defense. He was a year older than me, and every day I had to cover him in practice when he was on offense, and then he would come over to the defensive side and he would practice on defense, and we worked out together every single day. Gordy in his senior year gets drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers, and I'm getting ready to go into, I'm a junior, getting ready to go into my senior year finally as a starter in spring practice. On the second to last practice, I blow my knee. Completely shredded, ACL, MCL, all of it. Have to have surgery. <clears throat> I come out of surgery April of 1987, April of 1988, and there's two people in the waiting room waiting for me. My mother and Gordy Lockbaum. Gordy Lockbaum, the Heisman Trophy candidate. Gordy Lockbaum, been featured in Sports Illustrated, Seventeen Magazine, news stations all over the country. Gordy Lockbaum, who was getting ready to go to the NFL, and Gordy Lockbaum, who was two weeks away from graduating from college, was waiting for me. And he said to me, Marco, pardon my language for a moment here. He said, Marco, you worked your ass off for four years. You made me better. I needed to be here to support you. You know what, folks, that's leadership. Leadership is character. Leadership is empathy. Gordy and I are close today. We remain very close. That injury could have been devastating. It was devastating to me. But I want to transition to what happened next. I worked out, tried to come back that next year, couldn't do it. The coaches asked me to join the coaching staff as a student assistant coach. And they helped me get a teaching position in the city where I was. And I was still a senior in college. So I was coaching college football, was teaching at a local high school, and, and hence was born a love for education. So 33 years later, I've been a, a coach. I was a, a high school coach at a, a pretty well-known all-boys school called DeMatha Catholic High School. Eight years I coached there, seven of those years we won championships. Okay. From there, I became a school principal, and then I became a president and CEO. So I spent 25 years working with the brothers, with the Holy Cross brothers, as principal and president and CEO of one of their schools <coughs> before coming into this position now. And so when I think about leadership and this message for all of you today, I want to relay just two last stories. I hope that you're hearing all these messages clearly. To whom much is given, much is required. Leadership is character. Right? The third lesson is this. I mentioned earlier that all of us are endowed with certain gifts. So I had this Holy Cross brother who taught me freshman honors physical science. Brother Peter Bukmanik was his name. And Brother Peter, extraordinary person, he was old, old, old when he taught me. And he still taught for another 25 years after that. Right? Very challenging class. He gave me the only D that I ever deserved. Right? As a freshman in high school. Brother Peter was a genius, literally a genius. His IQ score was genius level. And frankly, Brother Peter had a difficult time communicating with 14-year-old kids, right? We, we just didn't think he was a very good teacher. We made fun of him pretty relentlessly, right? Brother Peter, as I later learned, when I returned to the school years later to be the principal of the school, Brother Peter, who was in his latter years, and actually a few months later from this conversation I had with him, he passed away. I would visit with Brother Peter from time to time. And so I visited with Brother Peter, and I one time said, Brother Peter, listen, I have a confession to make. And he said, well, Marco, I'm a brother, not a priest. You can't confess to me. And I said, nope, I want to confess to something that we did when you were teaching us many, many years ago. So Brother Peter, as I said, he was old when he taught us. He was about my height, very thin man, and he wore, I think, like a 15-size shoe. 
And when he would walk across the room, and we would, you know, boys being boys, we would, you know, get him to chase us around and make a noise or throw something, whatever, you know. And, and he would come walking, and he could only move very slowly, and he would clump across the room, stomping his feet. And it would take him forever to get there. By the time he got there, somebody would do something on the other side of the room, and then he would do the same thing. Awful. Awful what we did to Brother Peter. I said, Brother Peter, I want to confess that, you know, this is what we did. You didn't move around very well. We also thought it was hilarious that you clomped around the room in these giant shoes, these giant feet that you had. And just as I said that, I looked down at his feet. He was sitting in a recliner chair, and his foot was no different size than mine, about a size 9 or 10. And I said, Brother, we always made fun of you for having big feet. And his response to me was, Marco, I always wore my shoes two sizes too big to remind me that I'm not worthy to walk in Jesus' footsteps. Now here's the backstory of Brother Peter. Anybody ever heard of the Manhattan Project? What's the Manhattan Project? Yep. Atomic bomb. It's the atomic bomb. Brother Peter, before he was a brother, was a physicist on the team that created the atom bomb. And he was at work one day, and he just had this awakening. And this is what he heard the voice in his head say. You have been given gifts to be a force for good in the world, not to destroy. That day, he left his job as a physicist on the atom bomb. He discerned religious life, and he became a Holy Cross brother to be a teacher, to teach people to use their intellect, to use your intelligence, to do good in the world, to add and multiply to the world, not subtract and divide it. So message number three for you is to use your gifts to be a force for good in the world. And then the final lesson. Did anybody have a chance to look at the documentary on Father Hesburgh? No? Okay, you should. All right, one hour. If you're a Notre Dame fan at all, you'll love it. But more importantly, there's incredible leadership lessons in that book, or in that documentary. So as you may know, some stats I'll read to you about Father Hesburgh, and then I'll wrap up and take some questions, okay? So Father Hesburgh, at the time of his retirement, had served 35 years as president at the University of Notre Dame. At that time, he was the longest standing university president in the history of higher education in the United States. So no other president had ever served as the president of a college and university longer than him. So he's best known for that service to the University of Notre Dame. He created the Notre Dame that we know today, right? So I'm sure that Mr. Boyle knows the story. Anybody familiar with Notre Dame, they know that, that during his tenure, our world was at war in the Vietnam War. We were experiencing the civil rights era where there was uh, still desegregation and the race riots that were going on in our country, right? People still had to, you still had water fountains that were for whites only or blacks only, okay? That was the period of time that he was president. He was also president during the time that Vatican II occurred, so where the church began to reform itself and prepare for the future. Hesburgh's commitment to the University of Notre Dame completely transformed that place. Frankly, it was in financial disarray and on the verge of closing when Ted Hesburgh became the president there. Now think about that, Notre Dame, which now is one of the wealthiest universities in the world, beautiful facilities, was on the verge of closing. And if you ever wondered why does Notre Dame play Navy every year, the Naval Academy every year in football, it's because during the war era, just for their own financial salvation, Hesburgh opened the doors of Notre Dame 
to allow the Navy to do their training and their studies at the University of Notre Dame. Right? And, and as a result of that, the Naval Academy said that we, would, we want to be able to play Notre Dame in football every single year, and Notre Dame will do the same for Navy. Right? So there's a real intimate relationship between that. That was all under Ted Hesper. But in addition to his career as a higher educator in Catholic higher education, Hesper was also a public servant, he was an author, and he was an educator. He was involved in a number of different civic and governmental initiatives, commissions, international humanitarian projects, and papal assignments. At the time of his retirement, he had received more than 150 honorary doctorates, meaning other universities recognized his leadership and presented him with an honorary doctorate. Still to this day, there's no other university president that has that kind of recognition. So here's the thing that I want you to know about Ted Hesburgh that you probably don't know. Ted Hesburgh, you're familiar with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, right? The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was during that civil rights era where the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, right, helped to change this nation's history, right, by, through, through efforts and, and, uh, and uh, desegregation, integration, right, created equality of rights for all men and women. The author of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was Father Ted Hesper. A university president got invited by the President of the United States, and by the way, he served on committees for eight different U.S. presidents eight different U.S. presidents. He served on committees for two different popes. Okay, remarkable, remarkable history. This university president in South Bend, Indiana, a small town in the middle of Indiana, became a world leader, changed U.S. history, changed world history. He wrote a document known today as the Land O'Lakes Statement which led to a, a later doc, a document called Ex Cordia Ecclesiae, which redefined Catholic higher education. He was the author of that. He stood in Soldier Field, arm in arm, with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. in 1963 for uh, an ecumenical prayer rally where he stood arm in arm and sang with Dr. Rev. Martin Luther King, Jr., We Will Overcome. He stood side by side with men and women who were just fighting for equal rights. That's leadership. He recognized the platform that he had as the president at the University of Notre Dame, and he recognized that God called him to be a force for good in the world. So my final message to you is this. This platform that we have. Some of you in this room will become business leaders. Some of you will become educators. Some of you will become journalists. Some of you will serve on boards of directors for major companies and nonprofits. Some of you will lead schools. Those are all platforms. Platforms where you're called to be a greater force for good as a disciple with hope to bring. So whatever platform you're given in life, whatever life brings you, just remember that you're called upon to be a force for good. Remember Brother Peter Bukmanek who said, whatever gifts you're endowed with, use those to make the world better, to add and multiply, not subtract and divide. Remember the words of Brother Walter Kramer, who said, to whom much is given, much is required. Remember the example of Gordy Lockbaum and Mark Duffner, that we learned that leadership is character. These are the things that I hope for you. Listen, folks, the world needs you. We're in terrible disarray, terrible disarray. The institutions of business and journalism and the church all have failed us over the last 50 years with distrustful leaders, with selfish, greedy leaders who never focused on other people. But we need those institutions. 
We need the church. We need good businesses. We need good journalists. We need good leaders, good people, people with character. And so as I wrap up, as Hesburgh scholars and as Holy Cross men, I hope that you remember these examples. And finally, I want to share with you eight words that was said to me by a college president that he says can change the world every day. And they're simple. Please, thank you, forgive me, and I love you. Those are words that any of us can use and should use every single day. So as I conclude, please forgive me for maybe speaking too long this morning. Thank you for indulging me as I shared my story and the lessons learned from great Holy Cross leaders who came before us. And as Dons and as fellow Holy Cross men, know that I love you and that I'm praying for you on your leadership journey. Congratulations, Hesburgh scholars. May God continue to bless you and let's remain disciples with hope to bring. Thank you. We probably have a few minutes for questions. So we have a few minutes for questions? Yeah. Anything, anything on your mind? Anything you want to chat about? Any questions? All right. I hope that you all take these lessons with you. I can't wait to see what the world has in store for you because when you're the ones that are sitting in those boardrooms, when you're the ones that are leading corporations, when you're the ones that are running this country and this world, I know it's going to be a better place. So thank you all, and uh, again, God bless you on your journey. Thank you. Well, guys, I want to thank Dr. Clark on behalf of Notre Dame for being here. Uh, he is truly one of the best leaders that uh, I've had the opportunity to interact with and what he's doing for our, all the Holy Cross schools around the country is remarkable and uh, it's definitely a mentor that I look to as a, as a great leader. So, uh, guys, I want to congratulate everybody in this room on behalf of Notre Dame, all the faculty and staff here uh, on becoming Hesburg Scholars. To our newest Hesburg Scholars, uh, I want to thank our veteran Hesburg Scholars for your leadership. And I think Dr. Clark hit on a lot of great points today, but uh, we say this here at Notre Dame all the time, and I believe it. The world truly needs a lot more Dons. So the guys in this room today, you guys are our future leaders. You guys are the leaders of our school, and I hope when we leave today, we leave this cafeteria, you go out into the school building, you take that to heart, that every one of you guys here today has a great responsibility. You make our school better. You make our community better, you make our world better, and that's what it's all about. I know how hard you guys work to be Hesburgh Scholars. That's something that's never lost on me. I lived that life in high school. I understand the sacrifices. I understand the hard work that all of you guys have put in to be here today. The late nights, the weekends, the study groups, the, the wondering how you're going to get everything done at night after sports and music and clubs and everything else that goes into being a Hesburgh Scholar. But I'm here to tell you guys, everything that you guys are doing here is worth it. Seniors, you guys are going to some of the best colleges and universities in the country. We're really proud of you, and I know you're going to keep working hard. Juniors, it's almost your turn to leave here as seniors next year. So I would encourage everybody, talk to these seniors. Sophomores, talk to the juniors. Freshmen, talk to everybody else in this room and ask, what have they done to be successful? Learn from each other. The reason we gather here today, too, guys, is I want you guys to look across the room a little bit. Now that we have our masks off and you can see everybody, and this is a special fraternity, a special community that you belong to. When you tell somebody that you are a Hesburgh scholar, people give you instant respect. Am I right, Mac? It's a badge of honor. There is not 
we don't give this award away to anybody, man. This is the this is the toughest honor you can achieve as a Notre Dame Don. You are a Hesburgh Scholar. And I meet alumni all the time, guys, and they always ask, how's the Hesburgh program? And I was glad Dr. Clark could be here today to give you a little bit more background on what a hero that Father Hesburgh was. I had a chance to meet Father Hesburgh several times when I was at University of Notre Dame. I had a chance to drive him home from Mass one night. It was the scariest night of my life because I knew if I got in a car accident or if I harmed Father Hesburgh, I would be on the cover of the USA Today. So to get that responsibility to drive Father Hesburgh, and I had to get him up to his, his office on top of the Hesburgh Library where Touchdown Jesus is. Uh, what a cool guy. What a really cool guy. So wear that, that badge of honor. Father Hesburgh, man, the best of the best. So when you tell somebody that you're a Hesburgh scholar, when your families ask you, you know, what was the breakfast about this morning, Go home maybe and learn a little bit more about Father Hesburgh because he's, he's the truth. He's one of the best people ever walked the planet, one of the best leaders, uh, so wear that proudly, okay? So I'm proud of you guys. Keep up the great work. If I can help you in any way, let me know. Uh, go out there and lead, fellas. We need you guys, all right? Uh, Mrs. Grillo, Mrs. Tomasetti, let's give Ms. Grillo and Ms. Tomasetti a great round of applause.